Okay. Are they ready? Okay. Good morning, everyone. I'd like to call this meeting of the Standing Committee on Government Operations to order. My name is Frieda Martzelis, and I'm the MLA for Tabacha and Chair of the Committee. I will now have all the members of the other MLAs in the room and the members of the committee to introduce themselves, starting on my left. Uh, Ron Bonnetus, MLA, Decho. Island Johnson, MLA for Yellowknife North. Caitlin Cleveland, MLA, Cam Lake. Lisa Semler, MLA, Novick Twin Lakes. And we have a, a couple of other MLAs on. Uh, MLA Norn, do you want to introduce yourself? Doesn't hear us. Um, I think we may be having some audio difficulties, so uh, if you could just give us a moment. So I got to do it all over again for the third time. <laughs> Yeah, committee room, this is Steve here. Uh, it sounds like your sound cut out in the committee room. Oh. So does everybody hear us now? Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. yes. <laughs> it's on. We can hear you now. Okay. Let's, let's start all over again. So good morning, everyone. I now call this meeting of the Standing Committee of Government and Operations to order. My name is Frida Marcellos, and I'm the MLA for Tabacha and chair of the committee. Now I would like to have all the our MLAs in the room to introduce, and introduce themselves, starting on my left. Ron Bonatrus, MLA, Decho. Alan Johnson, MLA for Yellowknife North. Hello. Caitlin Cleveland, MLA Cam Lake. Lisa Semler, MLA Novick Twin Lakes. Uh, Kevin O'Reilly, Frame Lake. Mr. Norn. Yep, yeah, Mr. Chair, Madam Chair, uh, Steve Norn, MLA to another world. And our clerk, Cynthia James, committee clerk. April Taylor, committee advisor. Today's meeting is being live streamed on the Assembly's social media channels. To, re to respect physical distancing requirements, non-committee members and the Honorable Shane Thompson, Minister Responsible for Workmen's Safety and Compensation Commission and staff will be attending by video conference. Good morning, Minister Thompson. Please have the staff introduce themselves and before you begin your opening remarks and presentation, I would like to discuss how the meeting will proceed. All comments, questions, and remarks will be each directed to myself as chair. Both members and witnesses will need to wait to be recognized by the chair before speaking. This process will ensure that everyone can be heard and no one is cut off due to technical di difficulties. Minister Thompson, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning. I would like to thank the committee for the opportunity to provide a Workman Safety and Compensation Commission's briefing on reports of unsafe work. Here with me today from WSCC are Deb Malloy, Debbie Malloy at WSCC President and CEO, Carrie Ingram, WSCC Chief uh, Health uh, OHS Inspector, Elise Scott, Chief Governance Officer, and my Minister Special Advisor, Jeff Ray. The WSCC's ultimate goal is to eliminate workplace disease and injury through its mission in promoting workplace health and safety, providing no-fault insurance to employers, and providing care for injured workers. In light, in light of the recent media article and inquiries about WSCC's reporting of unsafe work, I've asked the WSCC to provide a briefing for committee on what WSCC does how it governs and the responsibility under the Workman's Compensation, the Safety and the Mine Safety Act in regards to enforcement. Madam Chair, I will now turn it over to Deb Malloy, who will take you through the presentation with your permission. Thank you, Mr. Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, go ahead, uh, Ms. Malloy. 
Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Minister Thompson, for that introduction. Uh, we appreciate the opportunity to speak uh, with you, the committee today, and the opportunity to tell you a little bit about WSCC and, uh, and, and what we do in respect to our safety and occupational safety requirements. So the Workers' Safety and Compensation Commission, uh, we're an independent government agency responsible for administering a number of different acts, both in the Northwest Territories and in Nunavut. Our services are provided to over 4,000 em 4, employers and 40,000 workers, and annually we process about 3,000 claims, and we conduct, uh, on average, about 1,000 inspections to ensure safety across northern workplaces. Like all workers' compensation systems in Canada, the WSCC services are provided in accordance with what's called the Meredith Principles, and this is a historic compromise in which employers fund a compensation system and share liability for injured workers, and in return, injured workers surrender their right to legal action, and they're provided benefits while they return healthy to work. We're unique in Canada, and it, we're the only workers' compensation organization that services two jurisdictions. And an independent agency, so what does that mean? It means that the minister is responsible for appointing directors to the governance council, appointing the worker advisor and the deputy worker advisor, and in consultation, he does that in consultation with the uh, Nunavut minister who's responsible for WSCC. And then he also tables a number of reports annually, including the WSCC annual report, the WSCC corporate report, the workers advisors annual report, and the appeals tribunal annual report. So the minister is responsible for appointing the, the, the governance council itself, and it is the governance council which acts and governs the operations of the commission itself, and gives general direction to me as the president on the operations of WSCC. The Governance Council ensures the proper administration of the Act and reviews and approves all of our programs, operating procedures, and establishes our annual budget and capital projects. They ensure that the stewardship fund is properly protected, and they recommend to the Minister any changes they consider necessary to the year's maximum insurable earnings. Our vision is to eliminate workplace diseases and injuries and our mission is promoting workplace health and safety while providing no-fault insurance to employers and care to injured workers. And we do that through the exercise of our values, which include respect, engagement, integrity, openness, excellence, cultural safety, and financial stewardship. I talked a little bit about us being an independent organization, and our funding reflects, reflects this. So we provide the benefits to workers and administer occupational health and safety through the statute, and we're funded solely through employer assessments and return on investments. The territorial governments as major employers pay assessments annually, but they don't fund or contribute to the expenses of WSCC in any other way. The assessment and the revenue and investment revenues pay for our total benefits to claimants which include compensation, medical costs and pensions, the administration of the organization, and the cost of fulfilling the workplace safety requirements and responsibilities under the various acts. COVID-19 affected our fund as it affected many other employers. And early on in the pandemic, we deferred employer assessments from early in March up until October. Deferring assessments is a short-term solution but we have to be mindful as how it affects employer assessments overall and into the future. The impact on assessments after deferral is amplified for two reasons. First, while assessments are deferred, the WSCC must, per, must withdraw operational funding from the Worker Protection Fund. And secondly, these amounts are not available to earn investment income. We're required legislatively to be 100% funded and every year we have actuarial calculations completed to ensure that we can cover all our current and future costs related to claims. We recognize, however, that employers have been heavily impacted by the pandemic, and that's the main reason why the provisional rate did not increase for 2021, and it was maintained at 2020 levels to provide employers with some relief. The 
pandemic also provided us with some opportunities to work closer together with other government departments and agencies that we may not always be close to. We're a member of the Emergency Management Operations Group that's been meeting since the pandemic occurred. We participate in business continuity planning with the government. And we also, and more, most importantly, I wanted to highlight the partnership we developed with the Department of Health and Social Services and the Chief Public Health Office. An early example of how we, we started to work together, I was in contact with the Deputy Minister of Health early on and recognized that we had overlapping mandates, us in employ, ensuring safety within the workplace and of course public health ensuring the safety of the population generally. We talked about how we could work closer together and we started a partnership which has really continued throughout the pandemic. An early example was the development of a risk assessment tool to be used by employers to assess whether, where preventative efforts were needed. And this was reviewed and revised together with the Chief Public Health Officer. We've cross-promoted in our press releases and on our websites to ensure that the general public and employers knew where to get the correct information. WSCC staff attended CPHO press conferences to field worker questions about safety and employer questions about safety. Our OHS Chief Inspector meets with the Chief Public Health Officer regularly and provides technical information about personal protective equipment and business resumption planning. The WSCC and the CPHO have participated in various meetings with stakeholders to review and to um, to check their exposure control plans, uh, most particularly mining, MACA, and dentists to provide a few examples. And then of course, as the COVID Secretariat was, was established, uh, we, have, we maintain a partnership with them as well. Sometimes calls come in on the Protect NWT line, and those calls which are about workplace safety would be sent to us. And most recently, we did a few joint inspections with Protect NWT officers. Continuing on with how we uh, how we went through the pandemic, wanted to provide you with just a few statistics about from the Northwest Territories around safety. And as you can see, in 2019, we did about 600 inspections and about 415, what we call oh, sorry, um, six about 700 inspections and then about 204, what we call outreach. We had to change the way we do business in 2020, right after the pandemic started, and we couldn't travel throughout as, as easily as we could previously. So we adjusted our activities to provide more guidance to our stakeholders. We created lots of resources that could be shared with stakeholders on our website and through webinars, and we assured that our outreach guided the ways we do, wanted to operate safely. And as you can see, our outreach or our efforts overall ended up being almost twice what they were in the previous year. We created a COVID email and stakeholders could reach out to an inspector to get help. And that email alone received over 1,200 requests for information that were followed up on inspectors. The number of inspections did decrease, but we do feel we were much more proactive in 2020 than we had been in previous years. In a normal year, how would we select employers for inspection? Every year we have a lot of planned inspections in addition to things that happen through reports of unsafe work or through if a dangerous uh, activity occurred or a serious injury occurred. And usually what we look at is the previous year and we have a number of criteria that determines what priority that we put an employer in. So we'll have a look at you know, whether there's been a serious incident, whether they have high claims durations or the number of reported claims are high. If a claims they're having new or reactivated in a business sense, the number of claims and inspections that have happened in the past, do they have any outstanding directions, and how did they fill out their OHS questionnaire, which is done annually through the uh, the assessment season? So we take a look at all of those factors, and then we bucket uh, employers into different priorities, and usually that's how we plan how we will do inspections and engagements. Other things that we consider are, have there been any reports of unsafe work? How have they come in and how have they been handled? Are there any outstanding issues from the last time an inspection happened with the employer? And has the employer had any incidents or accidents since that last inspection? 
And all of that information is used to make a determination of who is inspected during our regular operations. The model that we use to achieve compliance is one that we always try and use the, the, most, the least invasive um, way to, to, to actually bring an employer to compliance. We will always try and collaborate, and the inspectors themselves always consider this model when they're visiting an employer. And our intent is always to try and resolve anything around non-compliance before it goes above to a place of regulation, where we have to either do orders or perhaps even prosecutions. We'll always try and do engagement first, and we'll always discuss and try and come to a good um, change with the employer. We'll do that through repeat visits, for example. To, to, we'll check things if an employer is, is determining a plan, and then we'll go back and ensure the employer is supported and how they're putting into that. So the four steps are really education and consultation and outreach, then it goes to inspection, investigation, and then lastly, prosecution. And this model is well known within, uh, within the world and actually has been adopted from a model which was uh, first used in Australia. So how do reports of unsafe work fit into that whole inspection process? Well, at any time, if, there's, if the general public or if a worker has an, has an issue or a safety concern about the activities in their community or in their workplace, they can submit a report either online or they can call an emergency line or they can call a regular line during business hours. If someone calls to, report a, to make a report of unsafe work, the very first thing that happens is the report is reviewed by an inspector to determine the urgency of the response. They'll determine if it's urgent and they need to act immediately, or if it's non-urgent, then it, goes, it will be looked at within a standard of three business days. We also review that report to determine the type of response. Does, the, does there need to be an inspection? Does there need to be a phone call that happens with the employer to have a discussion? Can it be? Can we have a discussion and then through guidance and education come to a result so that that unsafe work is not continuing? And then our outcome will be if there is a, if there is a direction that is determined after an inspection, that will be followed up on as well in writing so the employer knows exactly what they have to do in order to come into compliance with the Act and in what period of time. Our safety inspectors are professional and they've got a lot of experience and we trust in them to make good decisions. That concludes the formal part of our presentation. I'm certainly available. I also have our chief available here to answer any questions that you may have. Well, thank you for the presentation. Before I allow questions, due to time constraints, I ask that everyone keep their questions and answers on topic and to the point. I will first open questions to our committee members and time permitting will allow questions from non-committee members. I will now open the, question, the floor for questions. MLA Cleveland. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, I'm, um, there was a brief uh, slide in there in regards to other agencies. For example, the COVID secretary, it was mentioned. And I'm wondering if the minister can speak to how the WSCC works with other works with and coordinates with other um, safe work agencies within the GNWT. Thank you. Do you want to answer that, um, Ms. Malone? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, we we normally, in the normal course of business, the WSCC does tend to operate very independently. But during the pandemic, we did recognize that because of those overlapping mandates that happened between the Workers' Safety and Compensation Commission, for example, and the Chief Public Health Officer, and even uh, Protect NWT and the COVID Secretariat, that we did need to try and work in conjunction with those different groups. Um, it has been a work in progress, and I think we've, uh, we've, we've done that very successfully in a number of different cases. Um, we, and we have tried to do it. In the normal co of operations, it doesn't happen that much, but I think we did do a good job at that during this pandemic. Do you have a supplementary? 
Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Um, no, I appreciate that, and I, I guess it would be a case-by-case -case basis. Um, but I'm wondering if the Minister or Ms. Malloy can also speak to how the WSEC balances kind of their education versus punitive responses to different employer issues, and how do they ensure that fairness is achieved between businesses? Thank you. Minister? Uh, thank you. I'll start and then I'll turn it over to Ms. Malloy here. Um, so it's all about education from our end of things. Um, if you looked, I think it's slide uh, nine, um, I believe it, or no, sorry, slide eight. If you look at the pyramid, it's about education, um, outreach, uh, working with them to come up with uh, a positive re result that doesn't involve um, prosecution. Prosecution is the last thing we want to do. And But for further detail on how um, we make sure it's done right, um, I'll turn it over to Ms. Malo. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, as, as the Minister stated, we do try and uh, always come in at the, the lowest possible level of intervention with an employer and we will always try and firstly go in and educate. Um, we will take into account, uh, as I indicated in the priority, uh, how we determine priority of inspections. We will have a look at um, how employers have responded in the past. Uh, we will look at, um, has there been, uh, is this a, a first inspection or is this a multiple inspection? Is this a first direction in a, in a particular area or is this a multiple direction? Um, so there is, a, there is an element of professionalism that we rely upon our inspectors uh, to, to, uh, to, to, to exhibit as they go into um, and determining that level of response. Um, but again, we will always, uh, in the first instance, try um, and have a discussion around education. Thank you, Madam Chair. Emily Bonnebruch. Yeah, must see Madam Chair. Um, I know we've got the easy access to many of our communities that are on the highway system um, in the South Slave. Um, and most main airlines can take you to some of the larger regional centers. Um, I'm just wondering about the smaller communities, the fly-in ones. Um, how often does WSEC go into these communities? Masi? Minister? Uh, for, for that kind of detail, I'll turn to Ms. Malo. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so that is one of the things we take into account in determining our, our regular inspection schedule. Um, we will look at, as, we've, uh, as I've mentioned, one of the criteria is when we were last in, in a community uh, visiting an employer, if an employer has been visited, um, that, that is one of the criteria that we use to determine. Um, if there is a serious incident or injury, and it is in a community which is, is not easily accessible, our first response would be to connect with them via phone uh, to have a conversation, and then uh, if required, we would then charter uh, an, an airline to ensure that we have inspectors that respond to that. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Madam Chair? Yes? Um, so if you look at um, how we, on, um, I think it's this slide for our stats here, um, our outreach, um, we've now had, you know, just over 2,000 outreaches through it. So that's the small communities. We found that we've been able to um, do an outreach um, to meet the businesses and talk to them um, effectively. Um, so sometimes we may not be able to fly in due to the COVID, due to the communities. Uh, uh, request not to go into it, but we've been able to follow up uh, through emails, uh, phone call conversations. So it's, we found a new way of doing things and do, doing business, and it's been received well by businesses as well. So it's just, uh, we found a new way, and again, it's how we work with them. And uh, like Ms. Malo said, if we need to get into a community, we do get into um, the communities. Uh, but our first and foremost is if we get them through the phone calls and our emails and conversations through that. Um, we're very, very successful. Uh, we found that this last year. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, supplementary, uh, Emily Bonacruz. Let's see, Madam Chair. Uh, yeah, that sounds good. Uh, there's a bit of education in there, I guess, by phone calls, emails, and whatnot. Uh, 
I'm just wondering if, uh, you know, to really educate people face to face, um, whether you go into the small flying communities, probably every community, um, to educate employers in person and perhaps do presentations to uh, the schools. I wonder if uh, something like that has been considered. Let's see. Minister. Uh, thank you. Uh, with your permission, I'll turn it to Kerry Ingram. Thank you, Ms. Madam Chair. Thank you, Madam yeah. Chair. Um, we actually, when we do go into communities, we call ahead and try and arrange for um, presentations either in the schools or for the local government um, as well as the businesses um, on top of our inspections that we conduct and we try and initiate those before we go so that we have a good plan of what type of presentation is required. Thank you, Ms. Thank you. Ms. Zembler. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'm just looking back at the, the numbers. So it said that there was uh, 3,000 complaints annually and 1,000 inspections annually. Do you have a breakdown between uh, GNWT versus private sector for these um, these claims and inspections and also further broken down by regions in the Northwest Territories? Thank you, Madam Chair. Minister? Yeah, uh, for that detail, we'll have to get back to the member and committee um, because we don't have that ready at our fingertips. Thank you, Madam Chair. Do you have a supplementary? Yeah, um, just to further to that, if there is a greater, I guess my question would be, is there a plan, if you don't, if you do have these numbers, um, to the, to educate and provide that safety and prevention that was talked about in the presentation to these areas of higher claimants? Thank you. Minister? Uh, thank you. Um, that we can probably answer, and with your permission, I'll turn to uh, Mr. Ingram. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, we use our directed services with the priorities that we had indicated in the one chart. Um, and if there's communities that have a lot of high priority businesses that are having troubles, we try and focus on those uh, communities to provide as much outreach and education as possible. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Any other questions? Emily Johnson. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, early on in the pandemic, we had looked into the idea of deferring WSCC payments, and I recognized that WSCC actually has a limited ability to do that and that you have obligations to maintain the fund. Um, and, and there's some complication, and then the assessments are in NWT and Nunavut, but I was hoping I could get the, and for some context, Alberta did this and essentially the Alberta government then just subsidized and compensated their WCB for the premiums. Um, I was hoping I could get a breakdown from the WSEC of what the premiums are for the Northwest Territories and if you would have that information by sector, um, because when we had initially looked at this, uh, you know, it was $30 million or something, that's the number that's in my head, more money than we had feasibly done. But I think it might be possible for, you know, deferring tourism WSCC payments, recognizing just the lower number of work in that area and probably, you know, a significant decrease of claims. So I guess two questions, if we could actually get those numbers and if possible by breakdown by industry and any uh, thoughts of the minister or the uh, Ms. Malloy has on the on the feasibility of us doing that. Thank you, Madam Chair. Minister. Yeah. Um, so I think the member has three questions. Uh, the first two questions we'll have to get back to him for that detail. Um, in regards to what we're looking at, um, that is something that the board has, uh, the governance council has talked about. We're looking at. Um, how we can help the industry but also make sure we stay uh, within our ability to operate without going to government to get uh, 
more money um, because it, then it just takes from other programs that are being offered by the government of the Northwest Territories. But for Ms. Molloy, I'll actually turn it to her to provide further detail. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, we have been, um, throughout the pandemic, uh, in contact with all other provinces and jurisdictions to understand um, what they've been doing um, in terms of either deferrals or uh, rebates or uh, what else they could, uh, in Alberta's case, you're quite right, they did, uh, they did do some, um, uh, some forgiveness, I guess, or some uh, the government took on for small and medium-sized business. Um, that is difficult to do with the size of our particular fund, um, and it does have an impact. Um, our provisional rate was one thing that uh, we did look very closely at this year, and we were able to keep that provisional rate at the same level as, as 2020 um, into 2021 to allow for employers to have some stability. Um, the subclass rates, uh, which you've talked about, uh, we do have uh, ready access to those, and I can certainly provide that uh, to the committee. So that you'll uh, you'll be aware of which ones. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Emily Assembler. Follow up. We have three questions. Um, just looking at the uh, compliance chart that they presented, I'm just wondering, um, in the process to reach compliance from the claims that received on annual average, uh, how many times have the has WSCC had to lay charges at, on average in the annual? Minister? Uh, thank you. Um, sad to say, or happy to say, only two in the, the, this last year. Um, you can see that we're really trying not to charge where possible. Um, we have four steps, and to get to that four step uh, means that there's been some very difficult challenges moving forward. So, but we've only had to deal um, two charges in the last year. Thank you, Madam Chair. Supplementary. MLA O'Reilly. Yeah, thanks, uh, Madam Chair. Yeah, my question is quite similar to what uh, Ms. Semler said. Uh, I had a qu an opportunity to have a quick look at your 2019 annual report, and although you've got a few statistics in there and performance measures um, around compliance, I don't sort of see a, a system of reporting yet yeah, the number of prosecutions, the number of investigations, the number of inspections, and this outreach, I guess, that you characterize as uh, education consultations and so on. Can you give us some statistics over time, maybe for the last five years, about this stepwise compliance and how effective it's been, and maybe start to include that kind of stuff, the, that those statistics in your annual report? Thanks, Madam Chair. Minister? Uh, thank you, yeah. So we can get that information for you. Um, as for adding to, to our annual report, um, I will reach out to the Governance Council and have a conversation with them. Um, again, we need to work together to um, be able to do things and I can't see it being a problem, but there may be something that we're not aware of presently, but we will, I'll have that uh, conversation with the Go Governance Council and then get back to committee on that. Thank you, Madam Chair. MLA Norn, do you have a question? Go ahead. Yeah, uh, Masi Cho, um, Madam Chair. And just uh, looking at the, one of the slides here, I'm just going to uh, just uh, bear with me uh, for a sec here. Um, that caught my eye. Um, I think it was slide eight. Um, Um, it's actually you no know, the statistics for uh, NWT the chart uh, with outreach and inspections, um, and can you just uh, uh, can the minister just uh, uh, clarify what caused that spike in outreach and just clarify a little bit what uh, what that is? Uh, thank you. Minister. Um, thank you, um, Madam Chair. Um, so basically, the reason we had that spike was because of COVID. Um, we weren't able to do the face-to-face, -face, um, get into the communities. So we were able to outreach um, to 
we were trying to make sure that we provided the services that we needed uh, in a timely manner, but also in a safe manner. So you can see the numbers uh, at over 2,000. So that means that the department, or sorry, WSCC, did a really good job of reaching out. But what I should really stress is the relationship with our businesses. So they were willing to uh, reach out to us. We found that through this pandemic, we did develop better relationships with our employers, uh, employees. Um, uh, it just seemed to be a lot of communication, um, a lot of trying to understand and answer questions. But um, if I missed anything, uh, with your permission, Madam Chair, I'll ask Ms. Malloy to uh, follow up, uh, provide more clarity. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, we have been, we were very pleased and, and proud, I guess, of how WSCC, in particular our, our safety inspectors, were able to respond during, during COVID-19. Um, and as you can see um, in the year prior, you know, we relied heavily on face-to-face, on -face, and face-to-face -face is very important. But what we did find was we were able to do, uh, amplify our own response um, beyond our, our, what we could have expected during COVID-19. We had employers who were reaching out to us, and we were actually able to reach out to employers. We also employed a number of other means, um, and, you know, in, besides individual employers by producing webinars and producing a lot of information, which is available on our website in both English, French, and Anuktitut which we were very proud of to be able to do during a pandemic. Thank you, Madam Chair. Supplementary, uh, MLA Norn. Yeah, must see Madam Chair. Yeah, thanks for that uh, response. Um, I figured it was uh, COVID related, but I just thought to get the, to actually hear it uh, firsthand. Uh, I guess I had a, a second question. You know, I'm always, you know, always thinking about uh, you know, our workers and communities all over the territories and, and we have uh, isolation requirements at uh, two weeks. So, um, has uh, the WCC seen in a spike in uh, in, um, in claims uh, related to uh, isolation requirements? Thank you, Minister. Uh, yeah, um, simple answer is no. Uh, we haven't seen a spike in it. Um, but just to follow up uh, on the other question that Emily Norn talked about. Um, we're not going to stop doing the outreach as well. Um, we found this been very successful, so we're going to continue this besides the face-to-face -face inspection. So a good thing about COVID is we found a, a better way of making sure we're educating our people, working with our people, um, whether it's employees or employers. Um, and again, um, Ms. Molo talked about the webinars and that we've been able to do some really good work on that. So uh, I know I kind of jumped to, the answer was no to seeing it in there, but I need to, I think we needed to explain that this is some really good work that we're going to continue moving forward. Thank you, Madam Chair. Are there any other questions? Okay, there's just a, just before we close, um, is there an appeal system to a decision? Minister? Uh, uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. So there is a, an appeal system, but we also have uh, two sub-agencies or independent agencies that work. Um, so there's the, sorry, I'm just being brain dead here. I'm just going to turn to Ms. Malo here, um, Ms. Malo, with your permission, Ms. Madam Chair. Thank you, Madam Chair. So there are two levels of appeal. The first one is internal. It's called the Review Committee. Um, and that is an internal review available to, uh, to workers and to employers about any decision uh, that the WSCC makes. Uh, should someone be unsatisfied with the outcome of that review, there is an independent review through the Appeals Tribunal, which is a, 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 third, a hands, third, hands off agency, trying to think of what that word is, <laughs> a third party um, that, uh, that we, we do not have control over. So it's an external review process. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. So if there's no more questions, I want to thank you, uh, Minister Thompson and your staff for the presentation and answer the committee's questions. Have a great day. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I thank you to the committee for their interest in this important work that WSCC is doing. Thank you.